Well, it's another Wednesday night, and I'm glad to see you guys. Smile on faces. Everybody's looking good. Um, to learn a little bit more into this study uh, of deception, it's going to get a little bit deeper than where we have got the last two weeks. If you were not here, we have got into some serious stuff. Oh, yeah. Um, I hope tonight uh, we'll shed some light on a few things that you've probably heard before. But open them up for you so you can go home and study them yourself and, uh, and just get better eyes for some of the things that you see uh, around the world and what we've seen in the last uh, 150 years or so, something like that. So doing the research on this, uh, this study, I am thoroughly convinced that the Apostle Paul was correct in 2 Corinthians 4, if you want to turn there right quick. Second Corinthians 4, verses 1 through 6, I'll read them right quick. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling, handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. If our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ who is the image of God should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves for servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. When it comes to these subjects right here that we're studying, the Apostle Paul is absolutely right that it is Satan's plan to hide the light of the gospel for those who don't believe the lost. Um, we're going to touch a little bit, a little bit, on something we missed last week. We'll start the Bible study off with that, and then we'll continue on uh, through this subject here of evolution. Start with this. Well, let me explain this first. Who thinks they can tell me what this is right here? <laughs> I know it's a sketchy drawing, but who it's thinks they can? It's supposed to be the constellation stars okay. in the atmosphere. It is, it is, a, it is a constellation. Um, who knows what Polaris is? North Star. North Star, right? North Star. So this is the star that sits directly above and it stays there, it's fixed. Now, does anybody recognize this formation right here? Yes? Uh, that looks like a swastika. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what, what's this formation right here of stars? Looks like a dipper. Big dipper. Yeah. All right, the big dipper, that's what this is. Now, you are right. You know what that is? All right. Now, what's interesting about this, I just want to cover a little bit of this, and we'll move on. But this is very interesting, and it, it does tie into everything that uh, we're studying about Babylon. So this is called the will of life or the will of the year. Okay? So the ancient people used to get out. They would observe the North Star. And when they were observing the North Star, Polaris, they would see this constellation or this Big Dipper going around this thing yearly, all right? So summertime, it would look like this. The spring, the winter, the fall, it would look like this, all right? Now in the fall time, uh, remember, the ancient people, it was all about the crops. Remember that? It's all about sowing seed and harvest. And so as they were looking at the constellations, they were always wondering, when is it going to be springtime? When is it going to be uh Sowing time, sowing the seed. And then when it would come to fall, 
the fall time, of course, this was the harvest time. There was a celebration. And I wrote over here, there was eight festivals that were dedicated to sun worship, all right, during these times. And as they were watching this thing go around, they yearly, it looked like a wheel, right? It looks like a wheel as it's going around, correct? So they're looking at the star, and yearly, the wheel is going around. Now, in the fall time, they had a festival called Samhain. Who's ever heard of that? Samhain? Samhain is... Uh, when it entered the Roman Catholic Church, it is All Hallows Eve. What is that to us? Halloween. 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 All right. So this is their fall time. And so it would go around, come up, and this is the way it looked like. All right. Now the issue they were having was, is that in the fall and the winter, remember we talked about sun worship, we talked about um, how they believed that it was God's son and all this. Well, this ties right into it. They needed somebody to turn the wheel to get them back to sowing time. All right? That's what their belief was. Who, who is it that's going to get us back to this? Who's going to turn the wheel? Now, we talk about crops. The, old, the ancient people were all about crops. Why did Israel get sent to Babylon? Captivity to Babylon. Yes. Uh, idolatry. Okay, that's one reason. Anybody else? Yes. Every seven years, they're supposed to take a seven year, uh, not seven year, but a year rest of the ground. Correct. And for about 70 cycles of that, they never took it. Yes. So 490 years, they didn't do the seventh year Sabbath. All right? Who can tell me why there was supposed to be a seven year rest for the why was there supposed to be that last year of rest? So the ground could re regenerate. Yes. So if you're a farmer, if you talk to any farmer, they know that you're supposed to cycle the, the crops and, and so it, all the nutrients can come back into the crop. So you had, they, did, they refused to listen to God. They didn't serve the, the one year rest of their crops. They continued to plant. And they did this for 490 years. You see? And so if you divide that by seven, which is what God says on the seventh year that is 70 years mm -hmm. and this is why how long they were in Babylon 70 years so this wheel this wheel they needed someone to spin it they needed someone to get them back into the the sewing era the spring the springtime that person was the queen of heaven who's heard of her turn to Jeremiah 44. thee, but we will certainly do whatsoever thing goeth forth out of our own mouth to burn incense unto the queen of heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto her. As we have done, we and our fathers, our kings and our princes, the cities of Judah and the streets of Jerusalem, for then we had plenty of this, uh, victuals, which is food, and were well and saw no evil. So the queen of heaven was the one that they were worshiping. They were making cakes to her and all that stuff. Well, this thought of the queen of heaven came from the ancient people. And it came, this is one way that she was worshipped, was by waiting for her to spin the wheel to get back to sewing time. Alright? This is one way. Now, I'm going to show you all some interesting things here. Everybody knows what this is, right? Which, this is the swastika, right? Yes. So the swastika, we're going to tie this in. The swastika comes from two words. Su, it's, a, it's a, an Indian word, all right? Su, which means good, and asti, which means being. It ended up being, turning into svasti, which is well-being. 
and then into swastika, and then swastika with a W. All right. Now the problem is, is when you look at this, do you see this? Well-being. That sign, this sign right here, means well-being. Why is it associated with evil? You see, when we look at that, I mean, as soon as we look at them, we, go, oh, we know what that is. Mm -hmm. Nazism, right? right? Jews, I mean, it, it, we just pictures go into our mind when we see that. But the issue is with this, is it has nothing to do with evil at all. All right? We're about to see. Now, I want to explain a little bit of background here. That's Turkey. Everybody can see it. That's Turkey. Now, you see two C's right here? There's a C on this side and a C on this side, right above Turkey. Yeah. One of them is the Black Sea. One of them is the Caspian Sea. Right in between there, that's Southern Russia and Georgia and Albania. Yeah. That right there is called the Caucasus Mountains, all right? That's where you get the word Caucasian from. These are Indo-European people, right? Back in the ancient times, these people migrated and they started going into Turkey, they started going into Germany, all these, all the European places. They started coming down, going, so they went this way and this way, all right? Into Turkey, into Europe, and then into the Asiatic places. The Galatians, Paul writes to the Galatians. These are, if you look them up, they are Celtic people. Celtic people, which are, right now, which are Irish, Scotland, you know, these kind of people. It's a picture of Galatia. Galatia is right in the middle of Turkey. All right? Right there, you see the Black Sea? Right below that, that's Galatia. And it was the Indo-European peoples that come down and inhabited this. You get... What's interesting about these people is you get Hindi, Italian, Greek, English, Latin, all these different languages come from a form of their language. All right? That's pretty interesting. All right, now, what I want to do is I want to show you guys a couple of interesting things that this symbol is on throughout history before Hitler. Before Hitler, all right? <laughs> This right here is Athena, the goddess Athena. All right, Greek. You see on her dress, on her robe down there, at the bottom? That's swastikas. You got a serpent, it's the serpents, and then you got the swastika on her, on her robe. This is Native American. Native American. Okay? This, is a, this right here on the left is a poker chip. From the 1920s. And you see her headdress. It's got the swastika on as well. When you look at this, you go, wait a minute, American? How in the world are they wearing swastikas? Yeah. Right? <laughs> this is also a rug. And this is some pottery. You can see the pottery right there on the top. Oh. Who knows who this is? Anybody? This is a picture of Thor. Anybody ever heard of Thor? Right. Thursday? That's where we get the name Thursday from, from Thor. Thor was a, he was a, a god. Now what's interesting about him is, that's his belt. Is that swastika? Another interesting thing about Thor is his father's name is Odin. And Odin was of the Vikings god. And this is where we get Santa Claus from, from Odin. Right? Yeah. He, he used to ride goats, horned goats through the air, and this is where we get Santa Claus from. Y'all remember this sign, this symbol here? This is from the Theosophical Society. H.P. Blavatsky, Alice Bailey, you see the top there? That circle on the top, got the swastika in there? Yeah. That's from Hind uh, India. 
Now, let's see if I got any more. Okay, well, here's the other Guess where this guy's from? America. What? Look at his patch on his shoulder there. What? That's, a, that's Army, 45th Division Army before World War II. See that? Las Vegas International Scouting Museum. The Boy Scouts. That was one of their tokens. <laughs> Interesting, right? Very. All right. Stay right here for a second. So, a couple other interesting things here. <coughs> it's a symbol that was found all around the world. It's the second uh, most sacred symbol in Hinduism. It represents universal harmony and balance of opposites in Buddhism. And it's the only holy symbol in Jainism. All right? Asian, uh, Asian places over there. It was also found on 1930s greeting cards before World War II. Now, of course, we got Adolf Hitler, his book Mein Kampf, which, is, which means my struggle. The swastika was in Germany in the 1880s, way before, I mean, before he was even born. The swastika was there. And it was founded, well, the reason it came to Germany, a little bit of history, is a guy named Schleiman. Uh, Heinrich Schleiman was an archaeologist who... Uh, was working in the excavations of what he's supposed to be Troy, and he found a bunch of artifacts with the swastika on there. And he brings them to Germany, and they start um, having exhibits and things like that. And a Polish librarian took about 300 items. He exhibits them, and then he starts talk, He starts telling everybody that this is an ancient symbol of an ancient people that uh, are divine, basically. So, and then it ends up turning into uh, that they were the Atlanteans and that they were the Aryans. Everybody's heard of Aryan people, right? Oh, yeah. This is the people that this man right here was trying to resurrect. He was going all over the place. He would go to India. Uh, he was killing people off uh, to try to build this race of people, this Aryan blue-eyed, blonde-haired Aryan race, which he thought was superior, which... If you really look into it, uh, you tell me how many colored people were in the German army. There was zero. There was zero. It was a very racist thing that he was doing. So, uh, a couple other things here. The, the information I'm getting this from is a book called The Swastika. It's by Malcolm Quinn, if, you, you know, if, you, if you're writing things down. Um, it was also used by a nationalist group in Germany before Hitler got a hold of it. And in his book, he is the one that designed, he designed that, that specific flag right there. He designed it and he says, in red, we see the social idea of the movement. In white, the nationalistic idea. In the swastika, the mission of the struggle for victory of the Aryan man. And by the same token, the victory of the idea of creative work, which as always has been and always will be anti-Semitic. Who knows what anti-Semitic is? Anti-Jewish. Anti-Jewish, right. Semitic comes from Shem. So it's... Get back here. All right. So, we know, it to become, we know it's become a symbol of evil... But in reality, it's not a symbol of evil. Who knows what this is? Charlottesville. That was a couple, a couple months ago. This is not, this symbol right here used for an evil purpose is not dead. You see, it's been hijacked. This is an ancient symbol meaning well-being. Yeah. And it's been hijacked for an evil purpose. So the will of life came from, or the swastika came from, this right here. If you know anything about the Big Dipper, it's called the Great Bear. And 
It's in the Bible. In Job 38, 32, Arcturus and his sons. You sing that, right? Arcturus and his sons. So there's the Big Dipper, and there's Arcturus. Now they got that part connected right there, but there's no lines in space. You know. <laughs> it's just stars. <laughs> but. So. That's where the ancient people get it from. Now, I want to end our constellation study with Amos 5. Amos 5. very interesting to see where these things come from and see how they progress, you know, throughout time. Because, again, when we look at the swastika today, that's what we see as evil. But all throughout history, even in the Americas, before Hitler, it was used all over the place for a symbol of harmony or well-being. So, don't judge a book by its cover. <laughs> Jer I mean, uh, Amos 5, start at verse 6. Seek the Lord, and you shall live, lest he break out like a fire in the house of Joseph, and devour it, and there be none to quench it in Bethel. Ye who turn judgment to wormwood, and leave off righteousness in the earth, here's verse 8, seek him that makes the seven stars in Orion. And turneth the shadow of death into morning, and make the day dark with night, that calleth for the waters of the sea, and poureth them out upon the face of the earth. The Lord is his name. What does he say? He says, seek him that makes all these things. And the ancient people sought the things that were made, not the maker. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting to see all the, from the last two studies and this part right here where what has come out of people worshiping the stars. You see? So, we'll end that with that. Now I want to read something for you. I want you to tell me if this is true or false. We're going to move into the study of evolution. All right? True or false? It is a factual common knowledge to most of the world that we as human beings are nothing more than glorified apes that originally came from the formation of bacterial amoeba and through a period of time we were able to adapt and overcome the obstacles that held us from progressing. It was by sheer brain power that we were able to grow legs in the water to be able to walk on land, grow hair to be able to protect ourselves in certain climate conditions. And then able to slowly begin to grow from a crawling on the ground on four legs to be able to now come to a crouch and run with speed to catch prey. Learning also how to feed our offspring in different and more effective ways. After millennia, we were able to make tools and hunting devices. We learned what fire was and not to be afraid of it, but to harness it and to use it as a resource. Then came the period when we began to walk upright. And because of the different climates and conditions, we started losing our hairiness and, be, and began to discover different ways to protect ourselves from the elements. We learned better hunting techniques, metalworking, mathematics, in-depth warfare, food preparation and, and preservation, etc. We have overcome so much because of how mentally tough and resilient we have been. And, as, and if we could see it now, we have moved into even greater feats of superiority and we'll discover far higher places than we can that we can achieve. True or false? False. Did everybody hear what I said? This is what the evolutionists believe. Mm -hmm. Now, nothing more than a glorified ape is what they believe. And I, I think a lot of people touch lightly on this subject because it has crept into the church. And so, Many Christian teachers, pastors, uh, whoever you want to say, tread lightly when it comes to this a lot of times. Um, 
but I'm not going to tread lightly on it because I don't think it should be. It should be spoken clearly, uh, as clearly as I can with my country self. So I'll just say this. Evolution is a Babylonian philosophy. It came from Babylon. I'm going to give you four philosophies that came from Babylon, which cover the whole spectrum of what we've been studying. One, all things are a result of organic evolution. Organic evolution is what? Just what I said. We came from amoeba and fish and apes and all the way up. So a creator is not needed, and the way is open for man to think that he helped his own creation and evolution, and that he, is there, and that he therefore has in his own self the power for his advancement. I mean, it's pretty interesting to think about evolution. That the power of a bacteria was able to become a fish. By, you know, they had so much brain power that they just, you know, it magically became a fish. And then somehow, through millions of years, we, the fish, we as fish, our ancestors, quotes, we were able to sift through the waters and, and see dry land. And we said, well, we want to go on dry land, so we're going to grow some feet. You see, it makes no sense. Second, the human intellect has preeminence. The educational systems of the day are enmeshed with this ideology. The kids today are learning entitlement. They're learning that they have the power. Uh, well, I'll just put it this way. If you think that the school systems and the governments around this world are not spiritual, you're wrong. They are very religious and spiritual. They have a religious mindset. If you don't believe me, go to the UN. Do some research in the UN. We've talked about that a little bit. That is a completely spiritual place. Third, promiscuity and sexual perversion permeate all of society. And it is all but encouraged, even if it often results in the breakdown of the home and marriage. That's a Babylonian philosophy. If you look back in history and you look through the Bible, the Jews... We're practicing this Babylonian mess where they were having these rituals to Molech. And I'll, I mean, we got we to gotta say what's in the Bible, all right? Molech was a statue, was there one of their gods, and he would be standing like this. And parents would have children to sacrifice to Molech. That was one of the purposes. They had children. So they would sacrifice their children and... They would burn in Molech's arms and the ashes would fall down. And while this was happening, or, well, let me, let me say another example. The Valley of Tophet was another place where they used to toss dead animals. And uh, it ended up being the refuge where Jesus was talking about Gehenna. But this is a place where they used to toss their children in the fire. And there was screaming in there. And what they would do is they would pound these drums so they wouldn't hear the screaming. And then they would have these big sexual orgies and all these things to drown out the noise. That's what was going on. <coughs> Did that come from them? No, it didn't. It came from before them. Solomon brought all these things in, into Israel. And where did he get it from? His 700 wives and 300 concubines that were from all over the place. Where did they get it from? It all stemmed in Babylon. And this is one of their philosophies. And it even permeates today. If you look at, I mean, the pornography business is one of the big, biggest businesses in the world. Mm -hmm. and, it's, and it's pierced, utterly pierced in the church. Utterly pierced, all right? Even to the breakdown of homes and marriages. Fourth, a total state or welfare society or arguably totalitar totalitarianism is the natural path to follow. Thus... The state, or in some case, organized religion will act for the people, think for the people, and do everything for the people. Mm -hmm. Boy, that America's heading, heading along that path. Yep. Amy? Oh, yeah. Um, total, totalitarianism. They're going to do everything for us. Welfare system. I mean, to think that, that we're living in a democracy and a republic and that philosophy came from Babylon is astounding to me. It's astounding. So... Now, it's a, these are Babylonian philosophies, but they were picked up by these type men, these philosophers, Socrates and Plato um, and Aristotle. 
a little bit about Plato. We've talked about a little bit about it, but you can go look this up. He got a lot of his knowledge from Pythagoras. Anybody ever heard of the Pythagorean theorem? Mm -hmm. This man, he said, it's, quote, it's claimed to be his idea, but if you go back and look at Babylon, they were so much more far advanced mathematically, and he was actually in Babylon for a little while, and he probably picked it up from there. So Plato gets a lot of his knowledge from Pythagoras, who was practicing magical science, not real science. Pythagorean, the, the Pythagorean theorem, if you look at it, it's, it's pretty mystical. Um, and then it was perpetuated through actually Augustine. If you look at him, he, he perpetuated a little bit, this theory of evolution. And then it came up and how it came into the limelight, into the social eye, into the worldview is this man right here. Charles Darwin. Who hasn't heard of Charles Darwin? Everybody's heard of him. <laughs> you see, that's how, that's how educated we've been into Darwin. Everybody knows that he came up with, they, they say, theory of evolution. Well, I missed this and I want to go ahead and explain it. If you go to Google and type in Queen of Heaven, this is what comes up. What does that look like? Mother, Mary Mother. Yeah, it's like the Catholic Church version of Mary. Mary. I don't know if I can read it. It says, Hail, Holy Queen. This is, what the, this is, the, this is their prayer, by the way. This is their prayer. Hail, Holy Queen, Mother of Mercy, our life, our sustainment, and our hope. To thee, uh, to thee do we, I can't read that. Poor banished children of Eve, to thee do we Stand up. I can't read it. It's hard to read. But anyways, they call her the mother of God. Queen of heaven, mother of God. That's what they call Mary. Which is obviously Babylonian. That's what we were just talking about. Coming from animals. And they think that's easier to believe than creation. Absolutely, yes. Crazy. Um, I was actually, I was driving... Uh, around somewhere, I can't remember where it was, but uh, I saw a Catholic parish that was titled Mary Queen of Heaven. <gasps> wow. No yeah. kidding. I mean, that's pretty in your face. Wow. All right, this is where we're at. Yeah, Google says that, you know, they, 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 they uh, ascribe it. Anglican Christians now by the ancient title to Mary. Yeah. Mm -mm -mm. We are definitely uh, being indoctrinated. I'll just, put oh, yeah. you, I'll just put it to you that way. If, if the first hundred, the first hundred subjects on Google, when you type in Queen of Heaven, is Mary. Yeah. I mean, if you got an ignorant Christian, you know, who, who, yeah. you know, new to the faith, they can easily get swayed by a lot of these things. So, mm -hmm. 1859, Charles Darwin writes The Origin of Species. 1871, he writes The Descent of Man. Both of these books talk about his observation, uh, the origin of species, his observation as he traveled all over the world, looking at the adaptation and the mutation of different animal species, uh, how their beaks changed and how different cultures changed their feet or whatever the case may be. And then he just applied those same principles to human beings, you see? And this, this is when he wrote The Descent of Man. And it was a very hot topic in the 1870s. D.L. Moody was one of the, one of the, uh, the ministers who fought you know, for biblical truth, saying that the theory of evolution was not biblical. Um, did you have some? Uh, the original title of The Origin of Species was not The Origin of Species. Uh, I can't remember exactly what it was off the top of my head. But it was something to do with favored races. It's still there. Yeah. Uh, and it doesn't say it on this cover. They, they've taken it off pretty much like every yeah. new publication, but its original it's, title was... Yes. Uh -huh. It does have to, It's the origin of species by means of natural selection and the favor of certain races. Yeah. What? So it's a very... Uh, it's the epitome of racism because he yeah. would call the... 
he would call the, like the African tribes or the aboriginals, you know, these kind of people, he would call them beasts. You know, those, <laughs> they were not even, they were not even, and this is where he kind of gets this picture from because you have the African tribes running around in the jungle, you know, uh, hunting for their food and things like that with spears and, you know, fishing these different techniques. But then you got the civilized world, civilized world in the West. And so he goes from here down to these places and he sees this and he says, well, there's just a difference. There's just a big, huge difference. How is it that I'm how I am and these people are still how they are? So he made a very clear distinction in his book of how he felt about those people. Now, the idea of evolution is that of natural selection. The meaning of natural selection is because resources are limited in nature. Organisms, being us, with heritable traits that favor survival and reproduction will tend to leave more offspring than their peers, causing the traits to increase in frequency over generations. So the, the, the better tools you got, the more survival you got, the, the better way to hunt, you're going to survive, and it's your kids that are going to permeate society. You see? That's natural selection. Survival of the fittest is another, another way to put it. So here's a quote by Plato. Plato believed, or this was his belief, believed that structures and form of organisms were designed to achieve ultimate goodness and harmony imposed on them by the external creator. I mean, we'll see how his view ties in with this spiritual evolution here in a minute. Aristotle was considered the father of biology. This is his ladder. And if I can read it. This was his, he, he, this is called the scale of nature that he put together in the 300 BC. It was way back. And, uh. He has categorized all the life forms on earth and put them in a ladder, basically like the food chain. So he says, inanimate matter is at the bottom, lower plants, higher plants, jellyfish, sponges, insects, arachnids, snails, clams, lobsters, crabs, etc., squids, octopuses, uh, fish, or octopi, sorry. Whales, porpoises, reptiles, amphibians, birds, mammals, and humans. So he's categorized, you know, all the way up. But the issue with the theory of evolution is it takes away this latter scale of nature because we've evolved from bacteria, right? And then we were lizards, and then we were birds, and then we were apes, and now we're human beings. So this latter doesn't mean anything according to the uh, nature of the theory of evolution. So, how is this theory unbiblical? How is it unbiblical? Does anybody, anybody answer that? Yes. Go ahead. Um, I'd say, well, the Bible tends to uh, be very exact as far as a time scale. Okay. And uh, the Bible's uh, very specific about how many days the uh, the earth was created. And then after that, you uh, can count uh, by years uh, exactly or around exactly how old the earth is. Uh, so in order for evolution to be true, uh, you would need billions of years of evolution in order for this to theoretically happen. And the Bible says that the earth is approximately, I'd say, around 6,000 years. Okay. All right. No? I was going to think about the same, same thing. <laughs> okay. He just said it better. I'll, anybody else? <laughs> yes. Well, on top of the time scale thing, you just have the general time frame. We know that all these things were created around the same time, within a matter of days. Okay. Because of this, we have humans with evolutionary ancestors at the same time. Say that again? So like, we it's talk fine. about the, a lot of times we talk about the in-between states of evolution, and that's kind of our breaking point for evolution, but the reality is,
humans are around at the same time as older generations of animals that would have been made extinct through evolution. Right. That's a good point. That's a good point. So I'll read a few points here as well. Uh, God made all creatures according to their kind. Did he not? So the beasts are their kind, and the fish of the sea, and the fowl, and the human being, they're all of their kind. And um, I don't think it's ever been, I think maybe they've tried, and they're still trying to combine animals and humans to see what will happen. But you can never get an offspring from that. I, I don't, if anybody can prove that, look it up. Uh, I don't know if that's happened before, but I've never seen it. So there was no way to mix kinds, according to the Bible. It would take billions of years for Darwin's theory to come to pass. And science itself has to be observable and provable, does it not? Right. You know, who knows who Ray Comfort is? Yes. Ray Comfort does these videos where he, he goes to these colleges and talks to these professors. And he asks these professors, these biologists and geologists, you know, things like, uh, you believe in the theory of evolution? Well, of course I do. So you're not a creationist? Of course not. And so he asked them things like, um, can you prove to me the evolution? Can you show me if science is observable, supposed to be observable evidence and repeatable, can you prove to me that it's true? And they said, well, no, it takes billions of years. You see? So there's never really an answer. Um, <coughs> We believe that God made man on the sixth day, according to the Bible, and we use a counting system to track Adam back to a certain point in time, nowhere near a billion years. Now, we're going to talk about theistic evolution in a minute. We'll get into that in a minute. About theistic evolution is people who are Christian who believe that God used the evolutionary process in creation. Right? Here's another thought. Man was made intelligent and with age. There's a difference, right? Man didn't come into being a man, like from the monkey to the man. Man was already created intelligent. Adam was able to name the animals, right, after he was created. Uh, not as Darwin puts it, he had to, let's see, we had to learn, so Darwin puts it that we had to learn over millions of years how to hunt and make tools and build when all actuality, man was given intellect right from the beginning. Man was made from the dust, not from a mesh of bacterial goo like the scientists claim. The natural world was made from things that are unseen. Here's another interesting. Uh, in Hebrews 11.3, it talks about, Paul, well, we can turn there right quick if you want to. Hebrews 11.3. So Hebrews 11, 3. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. So, I mean, when you read this, this has a double meaning. Uh, God is a spirit. We don't see him. You know, we don't see him. He created everything. But also, this could mean a molecular level. Atoms and protons and neutrons and things like that. Uh, we don't see them, but this is what the world is made of. Our whole existence is made of little bitty particles, right, that are combined together to make this, this world. So Darwin's theory, uh, when you talk about the Big Bang and all these things happening, and it eventually ends up to the theory of evolution can't be so, according to the Bible. Now the theory has, yes. Um, I was uh, just going to talk a little bit about the uh, geologic column, okay. uh, which is something I uh, learned about when I took a geology class. Uh, it pointed to uh, this thing that they called the geologic column, and uh, they use uh, what they call like the principle of superposition, which is like the older stuff is going to be at the bottom of the earth, the uh, younger stuff is going to be at the top. Okay. And they said, well, if you cut a hole into a mountain, then you'll be able to see that there are only little microbes at the very bottom, uh, and then as you increase, you'll see that the, uh, the life gets more complex, and they say that that proves evolution. And 
uh, you'd be like, oh, well, theoretically, if we could find a, like, some sort of example of that, then I could see why people would believe that. Uh, but then I learned that there exists no such example of the geologic column as far as a hole that's cut into a mountain where you can actually see the life progressing as it, you go higher and higher up. Like, that just doesn't exist. So uh, what they do is they'll find different fossils and rocks and they'll classify them and be like, oh, this belongs in this part of the geological column. Mm -hmm. This belongs in this part of the geological column. Right. Uh, but when you ask them, you're like, well, how do you know how old this fossil is? They'll be like, oh, well, because these uh, you know, fossils were in it, so we know how old that is. Right. You're like, how do you know uh, that it's that old? And they'll say, well, well, these fossils were found in. And it's just an absurdly hilarious use of circular reasoning by people who claim to be scientists. Right. I mean, I, to me, it's more absurd to have faith in the evolutionary process than to have faith in the Bible. Amen. I mean, it, you have to have much more faith. That's right. You know? So, it's very interesting. The theory has definitely crept into the churches, no doubt. Theistic evolution, who can tell me what they think that means? Gap theory. Was it? Gap theory. Okay, that's, that's one that's part one of the gap theory. One, 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 two. Who? Yeah. Sir, can you explain? I just give him the reference for the gap theory. Yeah. Can you, you know anything about it? The, yeah. Like, can you explain it a little bit? Well, God made everything, but then with the fall of Satan, uh, everything was corrupted, and therefore you get the word in the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep. Right. So there's a there's a gap between Genesis one, Genesis one and Genesis two. <coughs> Genesis one one and one two. One one and one two, yes sir. One two. And so there's a the gap theory is just like the pastor said that um, like God created that word created is a righteous word. It's it's a pure word. And it means that things were pure. But when you see that the earth was without form and void, that is the period of time that Satan was cast down. And when he hits, when he comes into this realm, he corrupts everything. So that's the gap theory. And the determination of time, how many years that was, is an undeterminate number. See? So, so they, that is part of theistic evolution. But the word the, theistic or theos, right? Comes from God. Is that just the word God? So God and evolution together. It's a we're we are we are theists because we believe in God, right? Monotheist, one God. Polytheist, multiple God. So the theistic evolutionists believe that the um, theistic evolution is the old Earth creationist belief. That God used the process of evolution to create life on earth. The modern scientific understanding of biological evolution, which is what we're talking about, is considered to be compatible with the Bible. There are various, various degrees of theistic evolution. Many theist, uh, theistic evolutionists believe that God set in motion the law of nature that led to evolution. But he did not take an active role in guiding the evolutionary process. He merely let nature take its course. Others believe that God actively guided the evolutionary process. That is known as evolutionary creationism. So, a lot of stuff there, but the basic thing is they believe that God used evolution uh, throughout the creation process and throughout the world to bring us to where we're at now. Um, I don't see it. I don't see it. I don't understand, you know, uh, you may have the gap theory, but it's obvious and it's clear that Adam was made from the dust. You know, that the human being <laughs> was not made by uh, an evolutionary process from animals. So, we all know who this is. In the world, I just want to let you know, in the world, if you ever, you're listening to news media, if you listen to the sports talk radio, if you're listening to any, uh, if you're looking on the newspapers or the websites that talk about Pope Francis, they say 
that he is the leader of what world? The Christian world. He is the leader of Christianity. So the world sees this man as the leader of us all. And so we fall under his umbrella. So whatever he says, the world will believe that that's what Christianity believes. You see what I mean? Now, Pope Francis, September 8th, 2014, he says this. Turning to the book of Genesis, or this is what the article says. Turning to the book of Genesis, the Pope noted the danger of thinking that God was a magician who created things with a magic wand. This is not the case, the Pope warned. God created things, allowing them to go forward with internal, in, interior laws, which he gave to everything in order that they may develop and reach their fullness. What does that sound like? God set within a, an organism, an internal law that will allow it to evolve into what we are today. That's called evolution. Mm -hmm. yes. and one of the things that ticks me off about that stuff is they're always, they're consistently doing this. Putting words into the argument to be against the argument that we've never used. Yes. Like the magic wand type thing. Correct. Mm -hmm. The scriptures, the, reading the scriptures would not even lead anybody to think of a magic wand. Mm -hmm. Correct. And yet they'll use that as though to belittle what we believe. That's yeah. right. And to um, just distance yeah. Now think about it. This man calls himself a Christian. He calls himself a Christian. And so when people look, go on Google, type in God is, God is not a magician, and a hundred things pop up about the Pope. Every news station, every news channel, every media outlet has that quote of him saying that. So, he also says, the Lord... That gives within the universe autonomy, but not independence. Um, this is because God is not a magician. He is a creator. Again, he uses the magician as if, you know, God can't do everything. Um, it's pretty interesting. Pet words are used a lot of times. Now, what about evolution in the schoolhouse? You see, because this is a progressive thing, is it not? We come up... Uh, Babylonians believe this. A lot of people didn't believe this before this man came along. Uh, but as he comes along, you have people grabbing a hold of it. And as they grab a hold of it, they say, well, we need to teach our children this. We need to, this is a scientific thing. Even though, I mean, this is one of the only theories that they hold as fact in the schoolhouse. I mean, everything else, they'll say, well, this is the theory of, you know, uh, whatever, you know, some of the some of Einstein, um, Theory of relativity, Einstein, things like that. They say it's a theory, and they teach it as a theory. But this, they teach it as a fact. Mm -hmm. You see, that's pretty interesting. So, who knows when evolution started <laughs> being taught full-time in the schoolhouse? Probably in the 1920s. A little later than that. Yeah. 1960s. That's what I was going to say, 60s, because I lived it. 60s. <laughs> in the 20s, actually... There was, you can go back and you can look at the... Dewey Socialism. I was saying with that, that's when it started, Dewey Socialism. Socialism? Dewey Socialism, yeah. So, in the 20s, there's actually a case, I forget the name of it, but there's a case in like 1923 where it was against the law to teach against creationism. Mm -hmm. You see? They, uh, they were highly upset with it. But everything, it started, this process started evolving into a court hearing after court hearing after court hearing. And finally, they found... The, the Supreme Court found it in the 60s that it was unconstitutional not to be able to let a teacher teach a science that she believed in. But if you look at it today, a teacher can't go and teach her religious views, mm -hmm. you see. She can't teach her religious views, but no. they, can, they could have taught what scientific method they, they believed in. It's pretty interesting. It's a double standard. Um, so evolution was in. Creationism was out, and it's been a controversy ever since. Mm -hmm. Now, because um, because we have learned this and it's been embedded into the schoolhouse and uh, into the children, I mean, this is what they learned. Who, high school, last 10 years. Yeah. 
high school last 10 years? Yeah. Is this what they teach in science, biology? Yeah. yeah. So anything about creationism? No. Nothing. <laughs> there was actually a, a Texas case uh, where Texas, uh, the state of Texas were getting on to the people who created the textbooks because they failed to put creationism in there. And they would not distribute them to the schools. Mm -hmm. And they actually had a big fight. And there was an article, a long article, I forget who's, what her name was, but I can give it to you, where she goes through and talks about, she calls the people in Texas fundamentalists, you know, mm -hmm. she goes back to these terms of uh, uh, creationist and all this stuff, where she's basically belittling uh, the people who believe the Bible and want to teach the children the Bible. A real education is what? Here's the, here's the pupil, and they get all views. That's education, right? And then the pupil gets to decide which one they believe. The problem is, is they have an agenda. And they're trying to teach people along this line. So that's the theory of evolution, basically. And a couple little tidbits in there to help you along, or help us along. But what's the ultimate goal of the evolution, the theory of evolution, the evolutionary process? The ultimate goal is to bring man from a monkey or, or a bacteria to a monkey, to a man, and then ultimately to God, mm -hmm. to Godhood. So the evolutionary process is not over. It's just begun. But we see what this lady is talking about today, how people are elevating themselves in this evolutionary process to a higher level. And I want to read that for you right quick. I put all references at the bottom there. You can go. Uh, this, is, this is the reference up here for this. But you can write these down. And you can go back and look at them. Uh, everything I'm quoting. You can look it all up. So this is Alice A. Bailey. In the book Reappearance of the Christ. This is what she says. The world today is more spiritually inclined than ever before. This is said with a full realization of the generally accepted idea that the world of men is on the rocks spiritually, and that at no time has the spiritual life of the race been at such a low ebb. This idea is largely due to the fact that humanity is not excessively interested. Listen to what she says about the Christian faith. Humanity is not excessively interested in the orthodox presentation of truth. What's orthodox? When you think about orthodox. You'll see some of the, the pet words that she uses for Christian. That our churches are relatively empty and are under public indictment as have failed, having failed to teach humanity to live rightly. These affirmations are distressingly true. But the fact still remains that human beings everywhere are searching for spiritual release and truth. And that the truly religious spirit is more fundamentally alive than, it, than in previous times. This is especially true of those countries which have suffered the most in the, the late World War. She, was, she lived back in, you know, the 40s. Countries such as the United States and the neutral countries show, as yet, no sign of any real spiritual revival. The other countries are spiritually, spiritually alive, not along orthodox lines, but in a true search and a vital demand for light. The religious, religious spirit of humanity is today more definitely focused on reality than has ever been the case. The orthodox world religions are rapidly falling in the background of men's minds, even while we are undoubtedly approaching nearer to the central spiritual reality. The, the, uh, the theologies now taught by ecclesiastical organization, both in East and West, what is that? Christian churches. That's what she's talking about. Are crystallized and of relatively little use. Priests and churchmen, orthodox instructors and fundamentalists, fanatical, though sincere, are seeking to perpetuate that which is old and which sufficed in the past to satisfy the inquirer, but which now fails to do so. Here's what's interesting about what she says. She says that the priest... And the pastor and the teacher of the Christian faith, the orthodoxy, uh, the theologians are teaching old doctrine that no longer relate to today. 
Here's the issue. Everything that she says is come from Babylon. It's older than the Christian faith. It's an oxymoron what she's saying. Sincere but unenlightened religious men are de deploring the revolt of youth from doctrinal attitudes. At the same time, along with all seekers, she calls people who are seeking spiritual evolution to a higher plane, seekers. That's what she calls them. At the same time, along with all seekers, they are demanding a new revelation. They seek something new and arresting uh, and arresting by which to attract the masses back to God. They fear that something must be relinquished, that new interpretations of old truths must be found, but fail to realize that a new outlook upon the truth, as it is in Christ, must be obtained. They sense the approach of new, impending spiritual revelations, but are apt to shrink back into their revolutionary effects. They ask themselves many questions and are assailed by deep and disturbing doubts, it is interesting here to note that the answers of these questions come and will increasingly come from two sources. The thinking masses who grow intellect, whose growing intellectual perception is the cause of the revolt from orthodox religion and from that overshadowing source of truth and light which has unfailingly brought revelation down the ages. The answers will not come as far as one can see from any religious organization, whether Asiatic or Western. She's got a lot of stuff to say. Mm -hmm. A lot of stuff to say. And as I look at the world today, a lot of what she says is true. The people, the thinking masses, are seeking a new revelation. They're seeking something new. They're tired of they're tired of the Bible. They're tired of the old paths. The old paths that God told us to take mm -hmm. in the Bible. Mm -hmm. You see? They want something new. They want to be spiritually revived. And that's exactly what this is going to lead, it, lead to, is a spiritual evolution they believe. And it all ties again into the coming one, the savior of the world, the savior of all the different religions, the one who's going to come and make, uh, make everything good again. But she actually says that before he comes, there's got to be a spiritual awakening, a consciousness around the world of love and unity and peace. And this man right here, is, that's exactly what he's doing. Research him and listen to what he says. Because he has a lot of stuff to say. He has a lot of things to say too. This is where we're headed. This is where they believe we're headed. This is what they believe about a human being. A human being is not just some being... That has a soul that God created and God is, a, is a separate from his creation and a personal God. But God is a universal force that has put a soul in everything. A soul in, if you go back and read some of her writings, they believe that, that a soul is in plants. It's in trees. It's in fish. It's, everything has a soul. And that soul is connected to a bigger soul. One soul, a whole soul, is one soul. We're all one soul. We're all connected. And eventually we'll come to the realization that we are all connected. And that God is in everything. Every cell of every living being or on this earth, God is in everything. And we'll realize that we are divine. And this will lead us to our destiny. That is what they believe. That is the whole start from Babylon all the way up to where we're coming or what they believe we're coming to the Antichrist. We know different. We do know that the earth is built on systems, right? System upon system upon system. So are we connected in a sense? Yeah. The trees give me oxygen. I breathe carbon dioxide which feeds the trees. The sun beams down and makes a seed grow and by that seed, I as the farmer come out and water the seed. It can't grow unless I put water on it or it rains. And then that seed grows into a plant and I eat it to nourish my body. So there's a lot of things that work together. The thing that evolution, as far as Darwin goes, fails to realize is there's... Who's ever heard of an irreducible complexity? I know that's a big thing, but 
An irreducible complexity is the ear or the eye. If you were to take away one of the thousands of parts that are in your eye, your eye wouldn't work like it's supposed to. It's irreducible. It cannot be reduced any farther. The liver is the same way. Answer me this. I'm, I'm throwing stuff out there now. But I want to answer me this. What came first? Was it the heart or the blood or the veins that carry the blood? Because you can't have one without the other. Right? If you don't have the heart to pump the blood, there's no blood pumping. If you don't have the veins to carry the blood, there's no blood going. And if you don't have the blood, the life, life is in the blood. Right? We serve an awesome God. He can do anything He wants and He can put all three of them together he, in the beginning. Right. And that's exactly what He did. What I'm saying is, as far as evolution goes, oh. in the human body, there's no way. God has made it to where these things cannot be broken down any farther. Exactly. You see? No. And so the liver just had to go. Boom, it had to just be there. Mm -hmm. Or the ear just, it had to be there. Mm -hmm. You see, it couldn't develop. And it can't diminish. That's pretty amazing, right? Are there any questions concerning evolution? Whether Darwin's theory of organic evolution or spiritual evolution. So I want to tie these two things together. The swastika, in ancient times, this... This created the swastika all through the ages. I use Hitler in Germany a lot because it was a pivotal time in history, as we can see. It's like a, it's like a it's like a marker point, you know. Somehow it always leads back to Germany or, or Nazism. They were using it to find, and they were anti-Semitic, but they were using it to find the Ary Aryan race. That is exactly what she says about spiritual evolution. Babylon, observing the stars, leads all the way to what they believe is going to happen again where the Aryan race wow. will be back. You see? We are the Aryan race. This spiritual race, that's what they believe. Not the Christians. Christians are the fundamentals. And they will separate themselves and ultimately be got rid of. Any questions? I'll tell you this as we close. Sin, this theory, continues because of man's sin and man's self-love. That's why it continues. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if the Bible is true, if this book is true, and this was God-breathed, and holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit of God, and it's true, then we are accountable to that God. You see? We're accountable. And if we're accountable to that God, then we have to do what He says. And He will judge us according to what He says. And the book will be judged by the book. They do not, people do not want to hear that. They want to live their lives the way they want it, how I want it, when I want it. And I want to determine if I'm God or not. That's, what they, that's the way people believe. And it's getting worse and it's getting worse. And it's infiltrating the churches as we can see. All this Babylonian stuff has infiltrated the churches. And it seems like an innocent thing on the surface of it, but it is not innocent at all. You have to go back and find out where these things came from. And once you do, as we can see, your eyes can be a little more open to it. And uh, you know how to combat it a little bit. So, if there are no questions, we'll go ahead and pray and let you guys go home. Yes? Um, I'd also like to point out that... Uh there's this movement called transhumanism, yep. uh, which is where people believe that they uh, are going to live forever and their words become God by plugging their consciousness into machines mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, basically living forever as these giant machines that are plugged into this giant hybrid computer system agree and it's really creepy because you can actually just go on youtube and just you know like 
watch these transhumanists talk and they actually like look at the camera and say we will become god you oh. won't stop us and you're like creepy yeah it's, it's all over the probably place. the creepiest thing i've ever seen it is all over the place next week last thing next week our study is going to be because we're talking about godhood people becoming gods and all this stuff what we're going to do is who is god and it's going to be a different approach but where, where not only people in the world don't see the things of who God is, but where Christians don't see. There's a deception among Christians. There's a reason why many people who call themselves Christians today don't fear God. Right? There is. Because mostly the only thing they hear is love, 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 love. God is love. Absolute 100% love. But the Bible tells you a lot of things about God that are not being preached. And there's, this is one of the reasons that there is the fear is gone from the eyes of the people in the church. And while people, why people out there have a certain view of God. So next week, it's going to be still a study of deception. But it's going to be more geared toward the church and what we believe about God. Right? So let's pray. Our Father, I thank you for allowing us to come out and study your word again, study some things that um, are obviously pertin pertinent to today and relevant to today. You know all things, Lord. You know uh, where the world is headed. But many Christians, your people, don't. Um, I pray that you give us eyes to see and ears to hear as we continue to learn these things. Your, your word says that we, when you were here, you said the first thing you told your disciples about the end of the age was not to be deceived. And I pray as we continue to do this study, Lord, that you would help us not to be deceived. Because there is a lot of language that the world is using. Satan is smart. You know that, Lord, and I pray that you... Help us as we continue to traverse through this world. You have put light in our hearts. Um, your word is a, a lamp unto our feet as we walk through this darkness. And so as we leave here, I pray that you would guide us in your word. Uh, that you would help us give us understanding and wisdom. And um, lead us where we need to go to see the things that, uh, that are of the spirit of God. Protect us as we leave here. Protect our families. I know Satan does not want us to hear this, but uh, it needs to be said, and I thank you for allowing me to, to say it. I pray all these things in the Lord Jesus Christ's precious name. Amen. Amen.